Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. John Bruni from Sage International has just arrived, sitting comfortably. Have you got a cup of tea there? Oh, no, nice cup of coffee. Good, Actually, good, good. Uh, thanks to Caroline. L- yeah. Les, Les Helicus was just uh, talking about uh, foreign policy and mm. the idea that um, uh, Penny Wong really shouldn't be standing up there lecturing Israel on what it should do and what it should say. What do you think? Uh, well, look, you know, we are talking about a, an elected representative of Australia whose very job is to um, carry a party political message to the world. So I would be cynical enough to say that's what she gets paid for. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do I think that she um, and her opinion about what Israel should do is valid? Well, I don't think anyone's going to be pushing uh, uh, Benny Netanyahu around in terms of what he ought to do with regard to the self-defense of Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, And that does pose some problems because, as as we know, since the whole October 7th issue, you know, the world is now divided in ways that we haven't seen on this particular issue. And it's actually quite dangerous. I mean, we're seeing a rise in anti-Semitism all over the world, which I don't think anyone was expecting to come out of this. And I think that the amount of trauma that the Gazans have suffered, and I'm not talking about the Hamas fighters. I mean, yeah. they deserve to be taken out. I'm talking about all the women and children have been killed as a consequence of being in the wrong place at the wrong time with no, yeah. no particular option to go anywhere. So what Netanyahu is going to get really is a, is a tactical victory and a... Uh, a long-term problem. A long-term problem, mm-hmm. yeah. See, one of the things that I, I read, there was a report this morning suggesting that in the next few days the Arabs and the United States will be putting forward a peace proposition uh, to this war. Now, I can't understand how this works because from the way I see things, Netanyahu's number one option isn't so much the defence of Israel, although he's using that as his cover. It is really um, the ability to drive home the number one agenda in his mindset, which is developing a greater Israel at the expense of the Palestinian communities. So now that the the Israeli Defence Forces are poised to uh, physically manhandle uh, Rafa, which is like you know the, the the southernmost crossing, the so-called safe zone, yeah. and you've got about 1.3 million people crammed into that tiny area. I don't know where they go because the Egyptians don't want them. So that means these people are going to be next on the IDF's hit list, which is not necessarily good because a lot of them are just fleeing the violence, you know, whether it's from Hamas or the IDF. Yeah. Well, Egypt could open that border and take them in, but uh, problem, that... problem. Why? Well, the problem is not all Arabs are the same. And this is something that many people don't quite get when they look at the Middle East. They say all Jews are the same, all Arabs are the same, end of story. They all deserve each other. You know, if you're bitter and cynical and twisted, that's how many people not of that background would see that area. That's why we say it's, oh, we throw our hands up and say we can never get on top of the Middle East because they're all the same. They all love violence. It's not, that is not true. It's a uh, gross generalisation. And the divisions among Arabs are profound. I mean, we're not just talking about, you know, the, the, the religious differences between, say, the you know, Sunnis, the Sunnis and, the and the Shiites. Shiites. I mean, that's one, that's one division. And yeah. it is d- a, a division that splits Arabs. It's a division that splits Arabs from Persians, which are the people of Iran. You know, then you've got the Egyptians who, you know, they believe that they're the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the, the holders of the pharaonic torch, if we will. You know, they, they still do have that ancient history. Um, but the current government of Egypt is no friend of Hamas. And they fear that if the refugees were to flood into the Sinai and they have to host them for God knows how long, because, of uh-huh. course, the Israelis don't want them back, then you're going to end up having about a million-plus refugees in Sinai. And the problem with that, of course, is that the Hamas fighters subscribe to the same ideology as the Muslim brothers. And if your listeners will understand, the Muslim brothers did have an experiment in government when they got rid of Hosni uh, Mubarak. Um, 
a few years ago. I can't yeah, remember yeah. exactly when. But anyway, there was that, that experiment with the Muslim brothers and it was so bad that El Sisi then took over in a military porch. So therefore, and where does Iran, how does Iran fit into this? It doesn't. Uh, really, it doesn't. I mean, this is the thing that we don't quite get. I mean, the Iranians, they, they funnel weapons and training to various groups in the Middle East. They hope that eventually, you know, if they put enough pressure or apply enough sweetness to a particular group, they'll do what Tehran tells them to. But they often don't do that. They often do their own thing. They seek opportunities. We see this right now with the, with the, uh, with the Houthis, for instance. Uh, we also see the fact that Hezbollah has been keeping its discipline in, you know, on the uh, northern Israel-Lebanese border yeah. where they've been exchanging rockets since the 7th of October, but only to a certain point and not beyond. Now, the Israelis have just broken this. They've gone, on, uh, they've gone in a couple of days ago really hard and killed, I don't know, about 40 um, people. We don't know exactly whether they're all Hamas fighters or whether or not they're Hamas and Lebanese civilians, but the fact of the matter is this has been an escalation and it was an escalation driven by the Israeli side. Now, you know, there is only so much that Hezbollah as an institution, a Lebanese institution, will take before they decide, well, you know, the Israelis have taken their gloves off, we're no longer going to be disciplined and we're going to start shooting back in a way that will hurt Israel. And they do have the weapons and the training uh, to give Israel a bloody nose. So that will not be a good escalation if it happens. Yeah, Lebanon's a very interesting situation because if you... If you looked at it, I think they used to call it the crossroads of the world. It was the most beautiful, beautiful city. And then because of religion, um, you had the Christians were there, yep. um, uh, the Druze. Uh, uh, I can't think who the others were. Well, you've got the Shiites, you've got the Christians, you've got the Druze. You've got a bunch of other smaller outfits. Uh, and as you say, they don't get on with each other. No, they don't. And uh, look, the, Le- Lebanon's central problem has always been a, a lack of proper central governance, which would be representative of all the groups within the country. It is a small country. The country now is a failed state. Yeah. They have no functioning economy. They haven't had for a long time. Hezbollah is the only organised political and military entity within the Lebanese borders mm. that mean anything. It's their birthday today, by the way. They were founded on this day in yep. 1985. Yep, yep. Doesn't say who founded them, but... Uh, yep. Mm. Well, you know, the fact is uh, they're here um, and they're not going away uh, anytime soon. And if the Israelis do think that they can, you know, get away with smacking them hard, I think they're going to be surprised when the retaliation starts. And I'm hoping that that does not happen because if we fear a broader Middle East war, that's when it's going to kick off. I take it that uh, the problem within Islam is that it's not like Christianity where you can have the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians, and they all kind of minor differences. But I take it these people really take what differences there are between their, their groups very, very seriously. They do, and I would argue that before all the Methodists and Presbyterians and everyone else in the Chris, on the Christian side of the ledger started getting on with each other, we also had our blood feuds and couldn't stand the side of each other and torched each other's churches. I mean, uh, we can't really look at the Middle East and also be blind to our own Christian history where mm. not that long ago we were actually treating each other quite savagely, Catholics and Protestants mm. in Ireland, for instance. Well, in France, the Huguenots that's right, that's right. Killed, killed millions. Uh, well, you know, and the Spanish Inquisition. But, but that sort of history doesn't seem to track when we teach kids at school because it's all about recent history and it's yes. all about the history that we want them to know rather than the history they ought to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you happen to see the Tucker Carlson and uh, Putin oh, stuff? Boring. Two hours? So two hours? boring. Just over two hours. It was like... It was like a, <laughs> Les uh, thought it was wonderful. <laughs> oh, Les, I beg to differ. I mean, I, I started uh, getting really sleepy at about 15 minutes in because I was expecting fireworks and nothing happened, you know. And, and it was funny because um, only recently Putin came out saying, oh, you know, Tucker Carlson should have asked me uh, tougher questions. I was expecting more from Tucker Carlson, you know, and blah, 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 blah. I was prepared. I was prepared. And I thought to myself, what were you actually prepared 
for? Were you prepared to push him out the window if he asked you the tough question? Probably. Or were He's you done pre- it before. Well, exactly. You know, <laughs> were you going to give him a, 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 a nice cup of polonium tea with a Novichok scone on the side? Mm. You know, I don't know, something tasty like that. Nice little treat. <laughs> well, uh, what was the point of it, though? Why did he agree to it? Well, Tucker Carlson, as your listeners are no doubt aware, had a big falling out with Fox. And he's struggling to maintain relevance. I mean, he's got a following. He's got a very hardcore following among certain people in the American domain. Mm. But the thing is, um, you know, when you're freelancing it, when you're no longer attached to a big corporate name and you're in journalism, quote unquote, when I refer that to Tucker Carlson, because he's really an opinion, uh, he's an opinion influencer, I think, of yeah, sorts, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, but a serious journalist, I don't think you can ever say that he was. But the fact is that he made his name, you know, attached to a, a big corporate media sponsor. He's no longer doing that. So for him to get relevance, he's got to be controversial. He's got to have mm. to get that angle somehow. Well, that was his angle, but why did Putin do it? Well, Putin wants to – well, I think that he wanted to signal to the West a few things, you know, that basically, you know, I'm here – You know, we're not losing the war in Ukraine and we're going to fight this war until the end, you know. And I'm not sure whether all of that message came across during the interview, but I think that that was certainly Putin's motives for doing it. And it was funny when he criticised Tucker Carlson and his line of questioning, expecting, you know, Carlson to come, come in from left field and really whack him badly. Um, you know, it, it isn't the fir- it, it's, it wouldn't be the first time that a, a serious journalist hadn't done that to Putin and lived to tell the tale. There have been journalists over the years who have asked Putin difficult questions. Carlson didn't do it. So many people who criticise the interviews say that Carlson was, act- was the useful idiot of Putin to deliver the message. And really, when you see the follow-up of Carlson, he went to Dubai to the World uh, Summit um, um, uh, the other day, and he was uh, sitting there taking questions from the audience, saying, "Yes, you know, it was really good for me to go uh, to Moscow and to have this discussion with Putin, and everything was, you know, as it should have been." I, I thought to myself, you know, yeah, you would say that because you have to say that, but do you really believe it? And I don't think he does because I think that um, if I was him and I'd look through those very mundane two and a half hours or. Thereabouts, I would think. God damn it! I could have. I really would have been able to ask him a few better questions. So but, money didn't change hands. That wasn't part of it. Well, we'll never know. We'll never know. We'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> it's for the war effort, Carlson. Please. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it right. It wouldn't be the first time somebody paid for an interview. Oh, no, no, of course not. I mean, you know, no. no. And, and especially at that level. But uh, I suspect maybe it would be payment in kind. I think, you know, there was that sort of spark of a bromance during the interview which kind of shows that they were really vibing off each other yeah, yeah. i mean in spite of the fact that putin then did take the first 20 minutes and just drive home all this obscure russian history about you know why russia ought to be in ukraine and all this kind of thing and it was like okay yeah we've heard this before you have said it before and you've said it before better but now you're giving us a lecture and the lecturer, you're not a lecturer. You're not very engaging either. So just shut up and get on with why are you using the military instrument to achieve your ends? Um, but the history is important. It, clearly, uh, he thinks anyway. Well, I don't know does. about the, the Russian people, but he thinks yeah. that he has every right to just go in and take it back. Well, look, every dictator who has issues of aggrandizement will always make that case. The thing with uh, Putin is that, uh, you know, he's made the case also that this is a NATO war, NATO did this, NATO's funding Ukraine, um, oblivious to the fact that most of Eastern Europe had been under the jackboot of the Soviets, a la Russians, Mm -hmm. for quite some time after World War II, lest we forget. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of those things that, you know, put yourself in the shoes of a Pole or a Czech or a Hungarian, I mean, maybe not the Hungarian under current leadership, but general Mm, mm, Hungarians, mm, mm. you know, where they all, you know, uh, Russian uh, Russian occupation was in recent history. It wasn't distant history for them. So, you know, did they vote with their feet when NATO opened the doors and say, well, look, you know, this is a sovereign right. Why don't you join us and we'll protect you? Yeah, sure. I think that that was probably partly why the Eastern Europeans jumped. If they thought that Russia was going to treat them well as potential partners – 
maybe they wouldn't have done so, but they were always in fear of the Russian bear. Well, and they, they still are. Personal well, right. experience. Well, exactly right. Should um, the Americans uh, seize the, the money, and I believe it's billions and billions of Russian dollars that are invested, uh, which they, uh, I don't know how legal it would be to just go to somebody's bank account and take the money and say, well, this is how we're going to fund the, uh, the money to rearm Ukraine. <sighs> that's, a, that's a complicated question, and I don't want to sort of um, avoid it, but we did do something similar to the Iranians for a long time to prevent them from extending themselves militarily. Now, that didn't prevent them from doing so because the Iranians, over a period of time since the Iranian Revolution in 1979, became very clever, used black market techniques and other sanctions-busting mechanisms and became very good at doing that. Um, would we be any better at nobbling Russia by, you know, nationalizing their assets in the West? It's a, it's a, it's a difficult one to say. I think yes, but then it also leads us down the path of escalation, which is another thing that many Western leaders are very worried about with Russia because, you know, the nuclear card has not been taken off the table and there has to be a point at which Putin must think to himself, the West is really an existential threat to us. My regime is not going to survive and neither will Mother Russia if we do not put something that the West will understand on the table and that is the nuclear option. And, yeah. and I don't mean that as a demonstration. I mean that as actual use. Yeah, well, I mean, God, what would, uh, what would that would be if an all-in third world war if that, if that happened. I mean, NATO couldn't uh, just ignore it. Even no. the possibility of it, could it? Uh, well, NATO's, um, NATO is the sick man of Europe right now. Um, transatlantic uh, relations are really bad. I mean, they were bad under Trump. They are not good under Biden. And if we were to indulge in a bit of speculation, they will not be good under a second Trump administration either. But what do you reckon about Trump's... Um, well, he's, he's, he's uh, thrown a throw a cat among the pigeons by saying, okay, all those delinquent countries that aren't paying their dues and picking up a fair share of the money it costs to defend them, uh, I'll, I'll back Putin uh, in invading them. Uh, that was a really dumb thing to do. I know that there are many wiser heads than Donald Trump uh, who work at NATO who really take the transatlantic alliance seriously yeah. in spite of its many flaws. And no one is saying for a moment that, you know, NATO doesn't have flaws. We're, we're in the 75th year of the founding of NATO this year. Um, we'll be doing a podcast at some point over the next month or two to, um, you know, just go through the problems and pitfalls of, of trying to fix European defence reform. But, you know, the thing is that if the Americans, who are the biggest and toughest operator in NATO, unilaterally withdraw. That's the end of collective defence in Europe. Now, the last time we ended any form of alliance system in Europe, we ended up having a world war. Yeah, League now, of Nations. Right. So we have now the Germans who are scrambling to rearm. Now they've put, uh, I think, 72 billion euro on the table. So they've reshuffled their, their um, internals. And they've found the money to start um, putting enough money on the table to assuage Trump and the Americans who say that NATO partners are shirking the deal. But one has to always remember this one single point about the NATO alliance. It's an American alliance. It was never intended to be a European-American partnership, not in the sense that people wanted to be today. Now, we've got people like Trump saying, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll hand Europe over to the Russians and that'll be enough to scare the Europeans to, you know, start spending big on defence. But what does that exactly mean? Let's break this one down. Okay, so what sort of defence equipment are you going to buy? Well, you'd be buying American, won't you? Because you're going to be buying American to invest in America and the American arms industry. That's great. What about the European defence industry? The European defence industry, you know, it's relatively big. And, um, and, and it requires spending to keep itself afloat. Now, the Americans aren't buying European defence equipment. They're buying their own equipment as oh, well. It makes perfect sense. Hello, who's there? This is John speaking. Uh, uh, hello, Jeremy. John. Hi, John. 
Hi, who's the gentleman you got with you? Uh, John Bruni from Sage International. We're talking about uh, Putin and uh, NATO and stuff like that. What's on uh, your mind? Um, city limits, the uh, Marion uh, uh, paper that comes out, you know, about the thing, and they've got um, volunteers. Um, they want to have an insurance on them. And I would have thought that a volunteer working for the council uh, would have come under uh, public liability. So volunteer, they want... W w th th this is a, a newspaper story about the Marion Council? Yeah, it's in their... In their uh, it's on their um, website. It's their... Um, they call it the city limits. So why would you be a volunteer if you have to put your hand in your pocket and pay somebody money to carry insurance for you? Well... Exactly, and the other thing I found amazing when uh, I was delving into it, are you aware that the councillors are considered not part of the Marion Council? Why, why is uh, that? Well, um, they're voted in by the constituents of the area, but um, they're not answerable to the CEO of the Marion Council. In fact, he's answerable to them. Well, I suppose it's a sort of a, a municipal twist on democracy. So they how, get, but how could the councillors not be councillors? Well, Jeremy, they, they seem to be able to spend our money on various projects that they, uh, um, you know, have ideas for. Yeah. And at the moment they make a decision on that, I consider they're part of the council. Yeah, well, of course, they've got to be part of the council, otherwise they're, they're irrelevant. But that's how I was told that they're not considered as an employee of the Marion Council. What would it, what would a councillor be paid? Oh, from what the figure that I got tossed with, uh, about twenty thousand a year. Well, they're being paid. They're they're employed by the council. Yeah, yeah. That's the way. That's the way I look at it. Don't understand but, it, John. I don't either. It's. Uh, um, it amazes me. And the other area that you're just talking about right, with, uh, um, you know, all the trouble that we've got in the world, it, it uh, really worries me what's going on, especially in the Middle East. It's uh, not good at all. No, it worries everyone. Thanks, John. Appreciate the call. Yeah, so they'll, they'll buy uh, American... Weapons, which is good for American jobs. Of course, in America is. first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this uh, we have to get over the fact that NATO is an alliance of equals. <gasps> there is no equality between the United States and any European country. Yeah. And under in, under the best circumstance, America would like Europeans to spend more on defence, but they would also like uh, the Europeans to spend more on American defence products, not European ones, which will then shut down domestic production across Europe, which will not favour the alliance as a collective entity because the Americans just don't have enough industrial grunt nor skills to furnish the Europeans with everything that they need. Oh. Right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What, what are these? Um, I, I know that Australia pays a little under $100 million a year to belong to the United Nations. What do, what do these European states pay to be part of NATO? Do you know? Not off, not off hand, but I can find out. Yeah, I, I've got no figure in my head at the moment. But we know from the United Nations that mm. uh, a lot of these people drag the chain and don't pay their dues. Sometimes not paying them on time, but just not paying them. Yeah, um, the problem here is about the structure of NATO itself. You know, it is a democratic consensual structure. I hate using those words. It's words they use. I yeah. read a paper on NATO and its internals last night to prepare myself for today. And, um, yeah, they, they use the same boring language that we'd all be familiar with with Vladimir Putin and Tucker Carlson. So you've got to wade <laughs> through a lot of this stuff, you know. But, um, yeah, it's all about consensus, you know, and, and it, it's a consensus that the Americans drive, basically. I hope it's not a bureaucracy like the United oh, Nations. It's, it's a bureaucracy. It's a bureaucracy. Yeah, it's a bureaucracy. Yeah. But, but having said that, there are many good people who have been acculturated to transatlantic norms as they are currently constructed, yeah. not as Trump would want it to be or maybe not as other American politicians would want it to be, but still they are dedicated to keeping as much unity among the NATO states as possible, which is not easy. Europe is not the United States. Europe is a collection of sovereign countries, yeah. each one with its own 
um, priority. Like, like, uh, and history. And history. But, but I'll give you an example from a strategic perspective. So you would think that with the current war in Europe, all eyes in Europe are on the east. What's happening with Russia? What's happening with Ukraine? That's only partly true. The, that, that would be true for, say, Germany, uh, certainly for the Baltic countries, certainly for the Nordic countries. But in the South, you know, the Spanish, the Italians and the Greeks, they're worried about another impending threat, the threat from migrants, the threat of terrorism, yeah. which is a different level and scale of threat, which requires different responses. Because, you know, we all know that uh, defence is not a one-size-fits-all cookie cutter, right? Yeah, and if you're yeah, dealing yeah. across different national jurisdictions, each with their own responsibility to their local needs, you're going to have to be mindful of all those differences. Well, Europe would be probably more concerned that uh, um, Africa yeah. would be a bigger threat to them one way or another. Well, certainly long term, definitely. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I agree with that. Anyway, it's very good to see you. Oh, thanks very much, Jeremy. Thank you for coming by. Thank you. The great John Bruni, ladies and gentlemen, from Sage International. How can people hear your um, your podcast? Oh, uh, you can find my podcast on YouTube, The Focus, and you can also find it on the Sage International website, sageinternational.com.au. Right, sounds wonderful. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.